Michael Alzanowski, Doug Barrett, and Mike Fertoli. Um, we're all um, going to illustrate the, the powers of the group mind and how thinking together makes the world work better. <laughs> that is like such that. a. Yes, that's that right. is such. <laughs> I, I actually <laughs> don't need to present now. That is, I mean, I just yeah, that's great. So yeah, welcome and. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to start. Um, Mitch had said something. I wish he was here, because um, I guess I'm probably misciting him, uh, saying, uh, "Love is a process, but sounds like a protest." And if anyone can correct me, that's just so fantastic. And I was I started reading Michael Hart interview with uh, the brilliant Lauren Berlant, and uh, he says that he's concerned with how love designates a transformative collective power of politics, transformative collective, and also sustained in duration. So I think that. I realize that kind of undergirds my entire my entire presentation. So um. Once in 2012, people took to the streets of Montreal to protest a 75% tuition hike. This Quebecois student general unlimited strike tactic has been used in the province eight times over in the past four decades and has proven effective in resisting the strategies to overturn Quebec's comparatively low tuition rates. By March 22, 2012, over 310,000 students were on strike. In this talk, I draw attention towards the soundscapes of the daily nocturnal protests of this 12. 2012 Quebec student strike, um, and these uh, daily nocturnal protests started at the end of April, so about two months after the strike started. Um, so I, I, um, I draw attention to these in order to develop a speculative means of articulating the plurality of resistances at play constituting these events. For the purposes of this talk, I would like to differentiate and tease out what happened during these nightly protests as the type of experience, the large-scale 22nd of the month marches, the smaller day, day marches, and the casseroles varied. There was a lot of protests going on. They all had ana analogous yet distinct stakes within the larger milieu of the fight of, against austerity and the fight for a less corporate networked future. I also situate my talk in relation to Kirsty Robinson and her PhD dissertation, Tear Gas Epiphanies, some of you are nodding, uh, on the Quebec 2001 summit in which she teases out sound as a transmission of protests and as a marker of resistance. By using these ambulatory nocturnal protests as a case study, I argue that a dichotomous or what I, oops, sorry. Uh, I argue that a, that a dichotomous or what I call a singular resistance discourse fails to account for the multi-layered complexity and intentionality of resistance by reductively signifying a given occurrence of resistance as either positive or negative. Mainstream media reinforces the ideological terrain and flow of a city by neatly circumscribing the protest movement as criminal and disruptive and the city as victim marking the city as passive rather than an active player that processes flows of communication in a network. By defining the city as event, as the relationships constructed in and around the network processing the flows of communication, we can situate the resistances at play in the student strike in explicit relation to each other and to the urban environment through a coordinated movement. In particular, I refer to my own first-hand experiences in the, during the night protest in order to develop a means of articulating the plura plurality of resistances at play. I'll just turn this down. My paper builds upon the scholarship on the positive affects of the casseroles that took hold in many Quebec neighborhoods and spread worldwide as a safe and family-oriented sign of support. Quebec casseroles originated in Argentina and Chile as cacerolazos, the banging of pots and pans, which were tools of the home, to protest and resist the oppression of the government. McGill prof Darren Barney has an evocative account of the casseroles, reading them through a framework of the potential of noise in a democratic state. However, I can't help thinking that the endurance, and we can remember the ideas of love and sustainability from Mitch's talk again here, so the endurance of the protests and the night marches paved the way of the ca for the casseroles. The endurance of the marches showcase an unwillingness to see anything but and that our demands were non-negotiable. 
In this resistance, the movement has no choice but to persist and impart its own sonic weight, often signified as noise. Following Ranciere, Barney suggests that noise works against the rational, efficient language of modern sound, and in that way, the government cannot conceptualize a negotiation with it, with the sounds, and only recognize it, its need to be managed. This is exactly what happened on the streets, an attempt to manage and control sound from a plurality of perspectives. Barney also evokes the body as crucial to the movement of the strike, which I think is an easy way to think about protests, and I don't specifically focus on that here, um, because I think it's too much of a shortcut and misses the political salience that I'm trying to evoke. I build upon sound studies and mobility scholarship on affect to develop an account of how the mobile networked occurrences of protests rearrange the city as event. By thinking of resistance in the plural, the boundary between the criminal and victim dichotomy that's ever present in protest becomes blurred, constituting the city as a site for a symbiotic movement of resistances. I also draw upon Whitehead to contrast two different ways of thinking of resistance. If we think of resistance in the plural as resistance already applying to an arrangement of related occurrences rather than as a dichotomy between a resistance, i.e. the student movement and an establishment, then we move towards ways of thinking the sounds and movements of protest in the reshaping of the city as event. So I argue that the city as event is a site of multiple mobile and fluid resistances that take place through sets of incipient occurrences. These location-specific occurrences include the sound of protest, forms of sonic crowd dispersal, traffic jam, police blockade, willing and unwilling listeners such as denizens and tourists, bodily functions, as well as sound movements absorbed by architecture and animal life. By analyzing the social and physical environment, this paper presents an understanding of the complex relations of a resistance, perhaps even parasitic, as Sarah says, takes without giving and weakens without killing, so kind of parasitic movements and activities within the human and non-human context of a host city, and their consequences for thinking with a more multi-layered frame. So if we think about the city as a site of resistances, Um, the protest is an event in which all of these resistant forces come together and move via their resistant identities. That is to say, the protesters are resisting against the ideological status quo at large, and they're also resisting against the social convention of walking on the sidewalk by walking on the streets, being told where and when they can stand in the street or with how many people, resisting highly contingent noise regulations also. This contingency of the sound of protest is marked by who's making the sound or noise and where they're situated when making it which are interpreted and signified, like I said, as noise or productive sound, depending on their context and depending on who is doing the kind of identifying, signifying. For instance, during the marches, the tensions come together and are, I, I would argue are part of the same movement, the, pro the police, the protesters, and the onlookers. So when thinking of protests in this tightly wound and contingent way, I think it makes everyone complicit. And by making everyone complicit, I do not, I'm not wanting to lay blame or pointing fingers, but I'm wanting to demarcate the relationality between all the actors involved, rather than a hierarchy of a kind of dichotomous victim, perpetrator binary. Without the protest, there would be no police presence. Without the police presence, there would be a different type of protest and so on. For the police, the sound of protesters means a space to control and discipline and punish. For pro-strike supporters, the sound of protesters may mean they're nearby and as a way to join them. Trying to find the sound of the protest was actually the most reliable way to find and join a march um, because the police uh, was uh, checking uh, people's Twitter feeds and, and things if you were to post any locations on there. Um, yet for people who live on the street, a protest means increased police presence and the displacement from their dwelling areas, often with nowhere else to go. And their resistance also complicates the manifold relationscape. One of the best ways for me to think about resistance is in the plural is to do so with the concepts that, uh, with concepts that eschew the difference between subject and object, which I think came up before, um, particularly in the descriptions of movement and spatial relations. Locative media theorist Andre Lemos recognizes spaces as having their own vitality, although for him it's only once they're constructed as places through our production of them. And he posits that place is an event, a movement space which is relative rather than absolute and when reality is a perpetual becoming. The place is an event created by territories, fluid areas of control, permeated by internal dynamics, as Bruno Latour argues. Places are flows, they're relations of networks. Places are never finished and always becoming. 
So in other words, they follow a particular duration that is assembled out of many components that all work in relation and move between being an object or a subject depending on their position within the milieu. This is explicitly illustrated in the movement of the sounds of the city during the protests that, are, that, con that these sounds continually change their meaning and then also change the kind of signification of the protest. So that is to say, specific sounds group specific people together and also differentiate bodies based on their role in the soundscape of the protest, as will be evident in the next part of my presentation. This shifting of identity also eschews traditional subject-object relations and presents it as what uh, Whitehead calls the object-provoking activity and the occasion towards the subject. So the subject-object relationship does not posit the two on a hierarchy, but rather with different roles in the occasion, a, spa a spatial and temporal instance. So for example, the protester is at one moment the subject resisting, and the road for cars, its object, being resisted. Or conversely, the police is the subject resisting, and the protester, their object, those being resisted. And these roles are constantly shifting in a processual manner. So uh, here I will outline eight parts of a soundscape of the nocturnal protests that I'm thinking through with the framework I have outlined. And these are images that I, that I took, actually. This was when I got arrested. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Um, it's just, it's, the, the pictures are quite interesting when I go through um, kind of, oh, eight... Uh, my eight points, especially if you imagine we're all in t-shirts and these guys are really scary and scared of us or something, I don't know. So uh, the eight parts of the soundscape, um, the first one is the chanting of songs and aphorisms while walking. So the chanting avec nous dans la rue, um, often in unison and in rhythm with other instruments, serves to unify the protesters and mark their territory as they move through the city. I wonder when is chanting in public space allowed and why is this seen as a disturbance to the peace of the city? For example, drunk people can be loud and make noise on a street late at night or cars honking and the kind of low frequencies of engine, of engine hum has been accepted as an allowable sound of the downtown core. While it's easy to denounce partiers and drunken people, the more productive way to think about it is what happens when we lose the binary of resistance and how the chanting creates new relations between these between noisy bodies and all of these different groups. What I had witnessed was that either those partiers and club goers often got louder to attempt to drown out our noise or cheer us on from the patios chiming in through the accessible rhythmic structure. Um, yet this chanting is considered noise pollution by those against the student strike and definitely by the police force. So our sounds make us a target for the police who at the same time constitute their own sounds of resistance. Before the police resist us, the police and the bodies in protest are organized to move in unison through the chanting and drumming and so on. The police purpose is to discipline and disrupt the rhythm, to disunify us, and to reorganize the bodies. Yelling disrupts the relationality that protesters are creating and creates another protest encounter. During the May 23rd kettling, which is the one we had pictures of, and other times, the police would shout, bouge, 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 like move, move, move. Um, yet another band of police would actually try to block you if you tried to go in the direction the police was shouting you to move, um, hindering your mobility. So this was a strategy to control and frighten the protesters who tried to resist by running away and dodging the police. And you actually couldn't because they're telling you move, move, move and pushing you in one direction, but there's already a police presence coming this way. And there's, uh, at that point, there's no way out. Um, the police controls the production of chaos, not which they signify as chaos, not through order and discipline, but through their own chaos, through a rupture of our unity. Another example of sound is the clinking of the boots in unison upon the sidewalk. Often the road is audible from far enough away. You don't see the police, but you can hear them. When the police march in this way, they're resisting <coughs> the rhythmic movements of the protesters. Their uniform march exhibits control and power of the body. This also extends to their uh, uniforms and the vari various shielding accoutrements we can see here. Um, and like I mentioned, most of the protesters at this point are in shorts and t-shirts, often with earplugs. Uh, we become attuned to the police boot clicks, as well as the clicking of horseshoes, most often trailing behind at the end of the march. Loudspeakers were most often used by the police to declare a march illegal because microphones and loudspeakers are signal-like sounds and exhibit control. 
However, sometimes the police would move into the crowd without having informed us, only to later specify on Twitter that the march was declared illegal. This was a strategy for further arrest of protesters and as a, as a way to dissuade people from protesting and participating with fear of random arrest or violence, which happened quite a lot. Loudspeakers were also then used by protesters to gain momentum for chanting and a general amplitude of making ourselves explicitly present on the street, resisting any form of quietude. So again, using the kind of same instrument for different types of resistances. As the police resistance increased, the use of sonic crowd dispersal techniques became more common. For instance, flashbangs along tear side canisters were used to disorient us, often released right into the crowd. The flashbang is designed to produce a blinding flash of light and loud noise without causing permanent injury. However, the loud blast causes temporary loss of hearing since a generic stand standard flashbang grenade has decibels I checked from 170 to 180 dB. Now, acoustic noise start in, starts, so that's quite high, right, 170 to 180. Acoustic noise start in, starts inflicting discomfort at the ears at about 120, um, pain at about 140 in the audio region, and eardrum rupture can occur depending on uh, how close it is at 160. So, I mean, I was reading all these U U.S. military reports also on this, and they're saying, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's totally fine, it's great, it's great, but obviously if you look at the numbers, um, it can be quite dangerous. So if you consider that type of blast or the sudden jerks of the police with the sustained sounds of the marching or singing along, we're able to see the contingency at work and the different kinds of noise and discomfort that happens. Um, another one is the looming helicop helicopter, which sometimes there was several. So for weeks, there was hum of the single helicopter pervasive hovering over the city, which many of us were able to see from our balconies or windows. So Montreal is not as big as... Toronto, and actually um, a lot of people, because it was high, the helicopter was high enough, people could, you could really see it. So in days we were not out marching, you can actually hear it as you try to work a rest, and eventually around midnight or later, it would be quiet again. Of course, the anxiety wouldn't dissipate. And sometimes there would be actually several helicopters creating their own rhythm in the sky. Helicopters are surveillance on top over us, yet also assuming a kind of position behind us. Um, the architecture also acts as a site of resistance by virtue of being built to withstand a spectrum of vibrational strains. The downtown core also creates echoes and reverberations, the lingering over time of residual sound in space. With its modern architectural structures and large brick and glass laden buildings that were often victims to projectiles of those resisting, insisting on resisting peace, although one could say that possibly those were done by people complicit with the police, I would argue. Um, I argue that the urban city is also modern it's in, in its efficiency and its way to create affect in particular ways, but also to showcase the human potential of mastery over the environment, which I think also the protesters are doing at the same time. Think, if we think about how they're showing mastery over the environment in order to have an efficient protest. In, indeed, a group marching colonizes the space and creates sonic booms that do not ha necessarily have a sensitivity to the environment around them because of their strateg strategically motivated singular ideal. Because of the timing of the strike, tourists also became part of this and part of the protest landscape, often trapped amidst marches, sometimes actually getting pepper sprayed also, and um, by the police. Yeah, kind of crazy, but... Um, I don't know if any of you know the Quebec police or uh, the, the kind of rumors around Quebec police or some of the most violent police in Canada. Um, but anyway, pardon? We know the police. Yeah, yeah. In, in, they're, they're, they're qu in Quebec, they're, qu they're quite something. Um, I mean, the most violence happens at the anti-police brutality marches, actually. Um, <laughs> Every year, every year, people get beat up and uh, arrested. Lots, lots of people get arrested. So, anyway, so um, the tourists became part of, become part of this um, landscape, and either they resist our moves uh, by shouting obscenities, but although and also kind of resist the police then by shouting and clapping for our support. I read non-participation and evasion of the loud sounds of the loud sounds as creating another site of resistance in relation to the protests in the city, and finally. Um, this is something, unfortunately, I don't have a chance to do because I don't have that much time. But um, I started thinking about what are the acceptable audio levels for um, birds and animals? And how do they resist? Because they resist the protesters and the police without differentiating between the two. 
And um, I was thinking through other living forms that we don't acknowledge during a protest, which I think maybe is another step towards um, having some of the things I've outlined become more robust and not just as a kind of addendum. And I'm not sure how much time I have. OK. Um, so just to wrap up, I think that's uh, thinking through this plur uh, thinking through this plur plurality of observations, the sonic textures of matter become foregrounded, such as the hiss of tear gas canisters or the clinking of the police boot on the asphalt, and form a kind of Whiteheadian vibratory nexus, a coming together of human and non-human actual entities that precedes a sort of subject and object divide and constitute a mesh of relations. So I'll just skip my last part, but I just want to... I didn't put up these uh, quotes, but I had some quotes from people um, just about the sound. So about the night marches uh, having a completely different feel to them. Uh, the night marches were tense and heavy. The noises were sharper and angrier. Firecrackers cheering. Um, the police sound bombs, sound of people running on the pavement. Moves in. Um, a lot about tension, a lot about the, the police, the clinking of the heels, which I had mentioned, and the helicopter downtown. It's true, uh, actually, even after the, the strike was kind of over, um, there was certainly, at least I felt it in my friends, kind of, you can keep, you could still keep hearing the kind of hum of the helicopter in the sky was really unsettling. <coughs> And yeah, this, after a while you start to fall asleep with the sounds all meshing together in your head, hearing the foot stomping and the chants and the whistles and the police. Really, um, every, I would go to sleep and I would just hear that in my head every night. I didn't really even see the images. I would just, it would just be the sounds. And that's it. <laughs>